Hello and welcome back to my channel. I'm Paul Kalmans, naturopathic physician and a former professor of naturopathic medicine in Portland, Oregon. And welcome back to my series on salutogenic uh, terrain medicine. This is the 15th video in the series. And I'm gonna, as usual, be building upon the material I've discussed in the previous lectures. Um, so in this video, I want to review a concept known as the sort of functional threefoldness of the human being. So we've been looking at so far four levels of organization uh, that can be discerned within the human being. Uh, and that would be the physical and then the fluidic and the gaseous, and I alluded that uh, to light as well, and then the warmth organizations. And they each correlate to a different aspect of our being. So the physical body, our structure, the fluidic uh, relates to our physiologic processes, uh, the air, gas, more to our, we might call psychic or soul processes, and then the warmth to our spiritual processes. But all of these fit together and they work into our physiology. So for example, the warmth to our circulation and the immune system, the gas light in the uh, nervous system and the nerve activities, and then the uh, fluidic processes and all the dissolved hormones and growth factors and whatnot in our fluids. Uh, so that's a fourfold way of looking at the human being. But today I want to review a concept that uh, comes from uh, Rudolf Steiner and anthroposophy, but it's actually a very, very universal concept in a lot of traditional medicines and in modern physiology and embryology. This principle can be seen very clearly. And this is relating the uh, looking at three primary processes within our physiology, within the forces that structure our form, and within even our soul and spiritual life. And this would be what I'm referring to as the functional threefoldness of the human being. Now, a uh, little bit about this channel again here, I'm trying to work towards a model of salutogenic or terrain medicine, something that is able to unite and integrate a lot of traditional medicines, but put it into a modern context. And uh, I'm doing this as, especially in natural medicine, as a way of going beyond some of the uh, more reductionistic models that we're seeing increasingly in natural medicine. So for example, in functional medicine, we focus a lot on the molecules and different systems, the HPA axis and hormones and that sort of thing. But how does it all relate together? And uh, that's one of the important things I wanna get through in this series is how do we develop a new map maybe that uh, would allow us to look more at processes and functions in the body uh, in a new light. And as always, if you like the material in this in this series, please uh, feel free to like and uh, share and uh, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. So in the last uh, video, I discussed this idea of how in the more reductionistic biomedical uh, thinking of today, we focus a lot on cells and cell physiology and so forth. And um, the argument I made in the last lecture is that a lot of modern research is showing us that you know, it's more than just the cells, that really cells themselves are determined by their environment. And these are what we might call epigenetic influences that arise from what is known as the extracellular matrix. And so this matrix essentially is the space around the cells that consists of the, uh, the connective tissue, the collagen and the so-called proteoglycans and elastin fibers and whatnot. These structural proteins are usually very saturated in water, so the structured water around them. And then there are other fluids, non-structured water, and dissolved in that, we get from our capillary supply, we get uh, an, you know, oxygen and nutrients, different electrolytes, but also hormones, as well as signaling peptides from organs. So all organs we now know secrete their own host of hormones. Uh, and these, this is a system in addition to the traditional endocrine system that we learn in school. Uh, and then cytokines themselves, some of these act as come from the immune system, but some are secreted from organs like the liver. There are a set of cytokines known as hepatokines, which are small proteins or peptides that, that um, act on distant organs and tissues and influence their function. So for example, in the case of the liver, we know that a lot of fat metabolism, adipose tissue, as well as muscles regulated very highly by these liver peptides. And this introduces the idea, if we look at the fluids, but also the nervous system and the autonomic nervous system that comes in here, to the idea of terrain, that all the cells, whether it be in a tissue and organ, exist in their own unique 
uh, exercise of their terrain. And the state of that terrain determines cell function. And uh, I alluded to some of the work by Michael Levin and others looking at how different uh, hormones as well as uh, different signaling molecules can influence ion channels in cell membranes. And that changes the resting membrane potential of the cells, the ground electrical state of the cell, and that then influences gene expression and so forth. So when we look at how cells function, even in things like cancer theory, we have to look beyond the genome and say, what are the forces in activities and processes outside the cell that regulate cell function? And this brings us to the idea of tissue processes um, in the extracellular matrix. So for example, we have our circulatory activity, there's the metabolic activity of the cells themselves, the autonomic nerve activity from sympathetic or parasympathetic fibers, uh, and then the fluid uh, state of the tissues. Is it dry or is it more what we might, might call moist or damp? And so this creates a map of terrain. And again, this is uh, what the sort of ancient medicines that are based in the idea of humors or fluids uh, were really interested in. They weren't as interested in cells. They were, cells weren't really known. Uh, hundreds or thousands of years ago in the way we know them today. Um, but we knew that there are forces, activities in the body that regulated the functions. And um, so these, these activities are playing out in the extracellular matrix. And this is really the basis of what I've been alluding to is a salutogenic model of health. Now, it gets very complicated when you start to look at all of these signaling molecules, neurotransmitters, hormones, and we, we, we can piece out a few and it's certainly important and very interesting to talk about those. Um, but we can also put them all together in a sort of kaleidoscope fashion and look at their gestalt, look at their whole from a qualitative perspective. So we can use this idea of color maps, and I've kind of introduced this idea of a color wheel to describe different states of the terrain. So for instance, when we look at the circulatory system, um, we can say that you know increased circulation, oxygenation, whatnot, increases the metabolism in tissue warmth, and that would be what we might call the fire or warmth in the tissue. Versus a lack of that would be more cooling um, and uh, you know maybe more of a stagnation of fluids and so forth. So that leads to more of a damp cool. So we can represent these physiologic states as colors. And um, we can start to look at each color and how they, they, they uh, sort of activate things. Now, are these colors real? Are they really there? Well, I'm using them more as metaphors, but it's interesting if we do think of the idea of an etheric field, <clears throat> um, a more sort of morphogenetic field that regulates our cell functions and whatnot, um, that these could be states of action in the field, say vibrational states of the field. Um, so there might be more to it than just a metaphor. But at this point, I think we can just stick with the idea of these colors as representing uh, physiologic states. Now, these states can become imbalanced, and that creates what in traditional Western medicine, but also Eastern medicines, Chinese medicine, Ayurveda, and whatnot around the world, um, there's this idea of tissue states, where, for example, we can have overactive metabolic activity, a heat state, or less than metabolic activity, cold state. We can have too much nerve activity that would create more of a tension, or sometimes this was called wind because it was related to that air uh, element again, uh, or maybe an underactive or an atonic state where there's not enough nerve activity. For example, the nerve activity in the gut driving peristalsis and secretions and whatnot. And then we can have uh, too little or too much tissue fluid creating conditions of dryness or dampness, we might call phlegm if it gets really thick kind of dampness in the tissues. This is more than just mucus in the respiratory tract. It's in the tissues themselves become saturated with fluid. And, um, and that fluid can, if it, if it becomes too structured in a way, can prevent the flow of nutrients and hormones and whatnot back and forth between the capillaries and the, um, the lymphatics and capillaries and the cells. And then the circulation can be an excess or deficiency as well. So these, we can define basically eight distinct tissue states, and we can map them on this sort of color wheel and uh, use, again, the colors to describe kind of tissue states. 
Uh, and there are many sort of modern uh, uh, perspectives on this in the 19th century in the United States and also in Britain. There is this movement known as physiomedicalism, which was really an herbal movement which attempted to use physiology in this idea of tissue states to sort of advance uh, how we can think about herbal therapies and whatnot. And then uh, herbalist Mike Matthew Wood in more recent times have uh, written a lot about this and he has some excellent articles and books uh, uh, on these topics. But the idea of, you know, the extracellular matrix takes us away from the cell a little bit. And so that's good. So we're going to look a little bit beyond the cell and look at the environment of the cell. But we really can't stop at the extracellular matrix. We have to start to look at, well, what are the, you know, where do we, where does the matrix stop? Well, really, matrices are, you know, extending around and through cells um, and they unite tissues together. And so we have a hierarchical level organization, you know, based on the tissues. But then, you know, the tissues themselves form organs. And the organs usually have distinct fascia, and they usually have their own distinct extracellular matrix, or what we call stroma of the organ. And then there's the working cells of the organ called the parenchyma. Um, so organs would be another level of organization. And then organs fit together in systems. So for example, we can talk about the immune system have many organs like the spleen, the lymph nodes, the thymus gland, and so forth. And then we have the whole level of organization of the body. So in a sort of biomedical pathogenic reductionist model, we focus more on the cells and the tissues maybe at that level. Um, at a salutogenic terrain model, we want to really focus on the opposite of the cell, which would be the whole organism. And that's where we have to start to look at how is there a way of thinking that allows us to think about the whole instead of just being an assemblage of parts. Even in, in uh, more modern integrated medicines, there's still this idea the organs are just kind of fit together like parts and you have the heart and the lungs and whatnot. Um, but what's the sort of how do these all fit together? And we have all these different systems. How are they all related? We typically think of the organ systems. These are really the foundations of inner terrain. So again, what the organs secrete and the glands secrete, these all create the um, uh, condition in the extracellular matrix, which is going to influence cell function. We can kind of group organs in different ways. So if you study physiology, if you uh, or anatomy, you know, your, your, in your textbooks, usually there's an idea of the organs based on the idea of structures. So we have you know, organ systems based on structures. And so from that perspective, there's really 11 organ systems. Uh, so there's the cardiovascular, which includes the heart and the blood vessels, the respiratory system with the lungs, the digestive system with your you know, stomach, small intestine, large intestine, as well as organs like the liver and pancreas and the gallbladder. And then we have the renal urinary system with the kidney and bladder, uh, the reproductive organs, uh, uterus, for example, in females, and then the nervous system with the different aspects, the central nervous system, which is the brain and spinal cord, the peripheral nervous system, which has motor and sensory nerves, and then the so-called autonomic nervous system, which regulates your organs unconsciously. Uh, and then we have our endocrine system with the classic glands like the pineal and pituitary, the thyroid, and so on. And then we have the immune system with all the lymphatic, the lymph nodes and the spleen and the thymus as, as immune organs. I'm going to come back to the spleen because it's interesting how spleen has many roles, actually, that are not just immune. Um, and then we have the so-called integumentary system, the skin, the muscular system with the muscles and the skeleton with the bones and the joints. Um, so that's, that's more from a structural perspective. And then we look at all these, how they interrelate to one another. Traditional medicines, and I would say increasingly in um, whole systems biology, we start to think about organs not so much as actual physical structures, but more as processes or functions. And so if we group the organs from a functional perspective, then we get a different type of grouping. Uh, we can think of each organ uh, on a more, we could say, we talk about fields, we can think of each organ as sort of a crystallization or a coming into being of that field. So it's something moving from the supersensory realm into the sensory, and we get an organ. So an organ is sort of a frozen process. It's an activity uh, in time that now is frozen into structure, into space. So that's a different way of thinking about organs. That's a lot more difficult. So we're not thinking so much about things, but as activities or processes. Um, 
And when we do this, we, we find in a lot of traditional medicines, there's different groupings of the organs. So for example, in um, classical Chinese medicine, there's the idea of the wuxing or the five phases. Sometimes they're translated as the five elements, which is not exactly right. They represent more activities or rhythms. Elements are more static uh, generally in the way we describe them. Um, but if we think of the elements or the phases as activities, then in these systems of medicine, usually five is the number of life in that sense. Um, I put this sort of picture here, the so-called Neijing Tu, which is um, some of the earliest examples are from the 19th century, but they're based on much older ideas. And they start to look at, if you look at this diagram closely, you see you know, different aspects, like what's happening in the head um, is more like going up into the mountains and you're contemplative and whatnot. Going down into the belly, we have more like agricultural processes, and then in the heart, we have more circulation. And so this diagram is really uh, drawn from the perspective of a functional or process-oriented thinking, not so much like on the left, Leonardo da Vinci's drawing more about structure. You can say in the West from the 1400s onward, there was much more emphasis on structure uh, rather than activity or function. Now, da Vinci was unique in that he also try to draw processes, activities like the flow of water and so forth. So he was, I think, you know, still within both worlds. But gradually um, in medicine, we've gone much, much more towards the structural and we've, we've not focused as much on the functions or the processes. Now, what's another way of looking at this? So again, I don't wanna just take from traditional medicines and uh, look at, you know, the five-fold processes of Chinese medicine or, uh, you know, in some of the more modern systems, seven is a number that comes up. I'm going to come back to that. Um, but if we start to think about how can we do science differently, you know, how can we move beyond the reductionist model? There is a way of thinking. This is known in some circles as the phenomenological method, which allows us to essentially combine quantitative and qualitative knowledge together. So we begin to look at the, you know, the details of physiology and anatomy. We can also look at the higher arching structures. Um, what are the gestalt and the forms that come through? Um, and so this allows us to move a little bit beyond uh, mechanical thinking and look at the bodies of processes of metamorphoses or transformations, how one structure can transform into another and is reflected in another. So this is a, a non-mechanical principle. This is more holographic in thinking. Each part of a hologram contains the whole, just as we can think of each organ, each bone is really being an image of the whole. And that's a, that's a more difficult way of thinking than the mechanical way of thinking. Um, so in, in reductionism, we start with the bottom, with the, the cells, the molecules, genes, and we move upward, the so-called bottom-up causation. In holism, we start from the whole, and then we go down into the parts. Um, and when we do so, we begin to see that if we start as a whole, a one, um, we find the first division is into two, polarity, and then there's a relation between the two, the three. So this leads us to a view of what we might call the threefold human being. And this is something that Rudolf Steiner, roughly around 1950 into the 1920s, put forward. But again, many traditional medicines have spoken about this threefold idea. And a really nice modern exposition of this is in a book by Johannes Rowan, who has passed away now, but he was a famous anatomist. In fact, he wrote some of the basic uh, textbooks we use in medical schools and you know, in cadaver labs. Um, but one of the last textbooks he wrote in his life was on looking at this functional threefoldness because he felt that the reductionist models in anatomy were just not enough to understand the how to look at the human being as a whole. So his book, Functional Morphology, uh, The Dynamic Wholeness of the Human Being, published in 2007, is a beautiful, beautifully illustrated book uh, looking at this. So some of these ideas come from there as well. But again, Rudolf Steiner was sort of the core of my particular inspiration in this direction. So if we just look at a skeleton, you know, let's let's make a, make it simple. Just look at a skeleton. We have a skull and a head, and of course a rib cage, the thorax, and some you know the shoulder blades and the and the arm bones that come off of it. Then we have sort of a the spine, but kind of a hollow area, and then a pelvic bowl, and then the legs come off, the leg bones come off the pelvis. So you know we generally learn memorize all these bones and the structures and anatomy. But we don't really ask, well, how are they related? What's the relationship between all this? Why do we have this form? You know, why don't we have eyes in our knees and so forth? And a lot of science fiction writers, you know, 
talk about that possibility. But it's interesting when you try to have people draw monsters or creatures from a different planet, they always come back to this same basic structure, usually mutated in some way. Uh, but this is sort of a fundamental structure we see in the vertebrate world. We can also see the beginnings of it in invertebrates, like in jellyfish. So, you know, in the human being, we have a head and a skull um, at one end. And the other end, we have these linear long bones, like in the legs, like the femurs and whatnot. So two different gestures. If we look at the skull, it's rounded and it encloses soft tissue, um, the brain, and then there's sensory organs, holes in that to, to let information in and out. And then there's the long bones, which are on the inside, and then muscle and whatnot surrounds them on the outside. So there's sort of an inversion, the round gesture enclosing, and then the linear gesture uh, is, is uh, enclosed uh, by soft tissues in, in the case of the skeleton. And then interestingly, in the rib cage, we have sort of an a intermediate area. We have the roundedness, especially at the upper part of the rib cage, which then opens towards the bottom. And then we have the linear gesture of the ribs. So it's a combination of the two as if you took the linear and the round gestures and put them together. Very interesting. So again, we're not trying to look at, well, how do these things come about from a cell or the genes? Just look at the forms and, and we start to, to put these different observations together. Um, so, you know, in the head and the skull, we really have concentrated there our neurosensory system. So this is where our primary senses are, and most of the nerves are concentrated. Now, this is not to say that our nerves all throughout the body, of course. Um, we have lots of nerves in the gut and so forth. But in terms of where the sort of bulk, where it's concentrated, we can say it's in the head, and that's where the main sensory organs are as well. And then if we look down below the rib cage, especially in the abdomen, uh, and then the legs and the muscles, here we have more our metabolic organs. So our intestines, liver, kidneys, gallbladder, pancreas, all of these different metabolic organs. Um, and then in the chest, we of course have our heart and our lungs. <clears throat> now, if we start to back up and look at these gestures and ask what are the activities that sort of occur in these different areas, here we notice some very interesting things. So if we look at the neurosensory system, you know, here we have information, we have sensation and then information processing and then usually some output uh, some information signals. So for example, hormones might be secreted by the brain to the body in very, very minute amounts. Uh, we might have nerve impulses go and direct our different organs in different ways and so forth. But this is usually working with what we might call imponderables. So thoughts and light and sensation, these different things which can't be measured easily. Uh, we can measure nerve activity, of course, but the stuff we do in our nerve processes really is difficult to measure. Versus at the other end of the spectrum, in our metabolic organs, like our intestines or our liver is sort of a classic metabolic organ, here we have activities related more to metabolism, digestion, as well as excretion, uh, all these different metabolic activities, as well as uh, the muscle system, which relates to movement. So unlike the head, which is actually when you want to think and, and be active in the head and, that, and these activities, we want to be very still. The movement system really gears towards activity. So again, here's a polar opposite. Um, and then in the middle, we have the heart and the lungs, which are related more to stillness as well as activity. There's a rhythm between them. So we can think of the rhythm of the heart, the contraction systole, when the heart becomes more head-like more contracted, and then diastole becomes more limb-like, more metabolic-like, as well as in inspiration and expiration. That's contraction and relaxation of the diaphragm primarily. So basically, we can think of the middle region as a rhythmic area that balances the activities that, that, that issue from the head and the nerve sensory system as well as with the metabolic activities coming from below. The metabolic activities really deal with what we might call ponderables, matter, substance, versus, again, the neurosensory system deals more with information. And then the circulatory and respiratory system sort of create a rhythm between the informational processes and the metabolic processes. So very interesting when you begin to start to look at the whole and look at these primary activities working through the whole. Now, it's not quite that simple because we can look at an area like the head and find that there's a three-folding there. We have the forehead and the eyes 
really, and this relates more, these are more the, the, the true rounded areas. Then we have a middle zone, which is the nose and the sinus cavities and whatnot, related more to a respiratory kind of activity. And then we have the mouth with the tongue and the jaw, which is movement. Um, and so there's a motor, it's almost like two limbs come together to form the jaw. So here we have this, the, the metabolic region of the face. Here we have the neurosensory region and here more of a respiratory region. So there's a three folding there. Each bone can be seen as having a threefoldness. So there's the long linear aspect of the bone, the shaft of the bone with the marrow inside, and then we have the rounded heads of the bone, more head-like. Um, so these activities are distributed throughout the whole skeletal system, all the organs. Each, each organ can have its threefold activity as well. And so this is a universal principle streaming throughout the whole human being. So again, this is a looking from the bottom downward. Now again, in biomedicine, we focus a lot on the cells, but these same threefold processes, if you look at the cell not as a structure or just a bunch of collection with the nucleus and mitochondria and the endoplasm reticulum and so forth, but if you look at it as activity, say there's really three major activities within the cell. There's the information system, which the cell membrane is really the similar to like a nervous system and sensing what's going on with the cell receptors and ion channels and whatnot, sensing what's happening in the outer environment, and then through intracellular signaling cascades, transferring that information inward. And then we have the information storage and the DNA and the RNA for how proteins should be made. Um, and so that's all part of an information system. Then we have a circulatory transport system and respiratory system. So we have the movement of the cytoplasm itself as well as transport vesicles, and the so-called Golgi body, body, which is involved in that. And then we have the mitochondria, which are the respiratory centers, almost like the lungs within the cells where oxygen is utilized and that's where we create uh, energy and warmth. And then we have our metabolism and movement system where we have things like phagocytosis and exo and endocytosis. There are lysosomes which dissolve and digest things. The endoplasmic reticulum with uh, ribosomes is where the RNA essentially coming from the nucleus is translated into proteins, which then run all the enzymes and the structures of the cell. And then we have uh, microtubules in the so-called cytoskeleton, which in the microvilli, all of these are active in motion of the cell, and then centrioles, which are involved in cell division. Um, <clears throat> so again, the three foldness goes all the way down into the cells. Now, we can go even deeper and say each cell has a different shape. So if you look at a nerve cell, it's usually long and stretched out. Um, so it has a sort of a body and then has this long tail called an axon. So it has an extremely large surface area. So we can say neurons emphasize the information system, the surface area of the cell. Versus if you look at a liver cell, which is at the seat of your, you know, your life activities, your metabolic activities in the liver, there we find that there is just a lot of this endoplasmic reticulum, a lot of ribosomes, so that metabolic activity is emphasized. Surface area is less, um, but the metabolic activity is emphasized. So each cell has a mixture of these three different processes, and we can almost, just based on the shape of the cell and the inner anatomy of the cell, we can almost deduce where in the body it would come from based on the threefold idea. Now, in uh, the plant world, there's the same threefoldness. So if we look at an archetypal perennial with a root process, leaf and stem process, and then blossom uh, with the fruit and the seed and the pollen and so forth. Um, this is, we can say, the same kind of threefolding occurs here. So in the uh, root processes here, we have more nutrient assimilation from the soil, but also there's a sensing aspect, and we now know uh, roots are, are like a type of nervous system in the soil. Um, they use soil fungi to communicate signals to other plants, other trees, and whatnot through the root system. Um, there's also the storage aspect, um, you know, almost crystalline-like in, um, in, in the root processes. And then in the blossoms, we have the opposite. There we have volatile oils expanding outward, pollen going outward. There's uh, actually the the petals of a flower are actually leaves that have lost their chlorophyll and now they have mitochondria. They can make energy and make warmth. So uh, plants can generate some warmth in their blossoms this way. And um, so there's, and there's also the reproduction going on here. So lots of metabolism and reproductive activities in the blossoms. 
And then in the leaf process, there's uh, where we have photosynthesis, the flow of sap <clears throat> up and down the stem and the leaf. And then we have uh, carbon dioxide coming in, oxygen going out. So there's a rhythm that happens here, just like in the respiratory, in the circulatory system in the human being. So interestingly, the th same three principles are present in the plant world. And each plant sort of emphasizes, especially medicinal plants, which is very interestingly, one or more of these principles. So some plants have enormous root processes, others have large blossom processes. So they put their energy in a way in one of the three zones. Um, what's interesting is if we compare that again to the human being, we have to say that really the human being or the plant is an upside down human being. The head of the plant is buried in the ground, um, and whereas we're in the atmosphere, and then the reproductive zone, the metabolic zone is in the plant is out there, the genitals hanging in space, and then in humans, we are oriented more downwards. So, and then the middle zone is, is similar, although in plants, they inhale carbon dioxide, we exhale carbon dioxide. Uh, we inhale the oxygen from plants and then exhale the carbon dioxide. So there's a mutual reciprocal relationship between the human and animal respiration uh, and what's going on in the plant with photosynthesis. So um, very interesting, the threefolding there in the plants is opposite the human being. Uh, and uh, if you just look at it from these principles. Now, so far I've alluded to life activities. So looking at the neurosensory system where there is relatively little life actually. The nerves are almost crystalline-like and they don't regenerate without their glial cells, which interestingly are images of metabolic processes in the head. The nerve cells themselves um, are uh, almost on the brink of death. In fact, each time an action potential goes through a nerve, the nerve cell depolarizes to zero which is what happens usually to cells at death. So there's a little death wave that comes through with every little action potential or nerve impulse. So nerves are on the brink of death versus a liver cell is burgeoning in life. And the liver particularly is an organ, you can cut out three quarters of it and it will regrow. That's not gonna happen if you cut out three quarters of the brain. And then other tissues kind of stand in between those two polarities. Um, so if we, um, that's relating to life and physiology. We can also think about soul processes, processes and what I've alluded to as the so-called astral body in the Western tradition, the air, gas, light body. Um, say there's a threefolding in our soul processes and they relate to these different physiologic processes. So if we look at our inner soul life, our inner life, we have of course thoughts and memory pictures and all of that, that's one aspect. Um, and that involves sensation, thinking itself, again, storing that in memory and so forth. Um, and then we have our feeling life, which usually oscillates between sympathy, where we are attracted towards something, or antipathy, where we are uh, repel, repelled by it, pushed away. And then there is a, uh, we might call will or action in the soul, that urge that to do something um, is the will aspect. Now, if we relate that back to the threefold principles, of course, thinking is something we usually associate with the head processes. Uh, and our conscious thought is usually, we usually think of that going on up here in our nerve activities. Um, our feeling life, on the other hand, we, you know, in neuroscience, we think of feelings as something that uh, occurs in the brain and then we, we, you know, we have that experience of them. But if we really follow feelings closely, we find that many feelings are associated with changes in heart rate and respiration. Usually, again, we think it's the brain sending information down to the heart and lungs changing that, but could it be the other way around? And that was an interesting idea from the psychologist William James at the end of the uh, 1800s. He argued that essentially feelings start in the body and then the brain picks that up uh, and we experience an emotion. Um, which is sort of an interpretation of the feeling. And more and more research is confirming that, that we have nerve fibers that are sensory fibers in all of our organs, and they are projecting up into different parts of the brain. And then we have you know, changes in the organ activity result in changes in the brain activity, which we interpret as emotion. Um, but the feeling itself is more subconscious. It's really below the level of uh, awareness. Like when we think about a math problem, that's more in conscious awareness feeling is more subconscious. I just feel down. I'm not exactly sure why I have this overall subconscious feeling. Um, there we might relate feelings more to a, to the rhythmic system, to the heart and the lungs. So the rhythm between sympathy and antipathy, we can almost think of a, you know, when you inhale, your 
coming more into yourself. When you exhale, you're going out into the world. More into yourself, you kind of become isolated. More out into the world, you connect with others and other things. So interestingly, there's that rhythm between contraction and expansion, sympathy, antipathy, uh, feeling life related to our rhythms of the cardiovascular system and the respiratory system. And then the will itself is based more in your muscles to move and your metabolic organs like the liver and the intestines that maintain the muscles. Um, and that is usually unconscious. So we usually are not fully aware of our will impulses. And part of the aspect of sort of becoming more aware is to become aware of why we decide to do something. Um, a lot of times we do things because of habit or memory or because our organs like our bladder tells us to get up and go to the bathroom. And we're not really conscious of that process. And that's why a lot of neuroscientists say there's no free will. It's just your body speaking to your brain. And we interpret that as our own decisions. Um, but again, in more traditional senses, there's the idea that the majority of what we do is unconscious, but we can gradually become more and more conscious of these activities over time. Um, but these activities are seated more in your metabolic system and your limb system. So thinking, feeling, and willing, three aspects in the soul life are related to your physiology. And that says a lot about how we can approach mental emotional disorders. So for example, with depression, um, that's often, you know, people are thinking and they're feeling quite well in depression. You know, they feel not feeling well, but they feel the depression, um, but they can't get the will to do anything, to get up off the couch, to maybe motivate to exercise or change the diet. That's because of a disorder in the metabolism. So it says that to, to, uh, to, to treat depression, we don't just treat serotonin and neurotransmitters in the brain, we support the organs of metabolism, the liver, the intestines, and so forth. And um, again, increasingly, the evidence is building that the gut-brain connection is extremely important in depression. We haven't talked much about the liver-brain connection, but there is such a thing, um, the heart-brain connection, kidney-brain connection, and so forth. So disorders in these organs can relate to problems in your willing um, as well as your feeling life. And um, so this is really a, a new insight into how we can start to treat mental emotional disorders. You don't, uh, certainly therapy and working more in a cognitive sense to become more aware is important. But at the other end, we can also support the physiology related to these. And as we'll see, and this is again, a foundation stone in traditional medicines, each organ is associated with a particular type of emotional state, say a mood. Um, and understanding that can give us, can clue us in into maybe metabolic processes that are too subtle to detect on conventional testing that we can treat with, uh, with different methods. Now, I've, this is all about the threefoldness, but what about the four fields that I've discussed? You know, how does it relate to the four levels of the human being? Um, and is there a connection between the physical, the uh, so-called etheric processes, life processes, the soul processes, and the warmth processes. And this is an interesting idea, again, from Rudolf Steiner, but again, we can uh, find this in many traditional medicines, the idea that really the fields work differently in the three different regions. So if we look at the head region, and if we just look at the brain, we find the brain is a relatively solid organ. It's, there's not a lot of space between the cells and the brain. So not a lot of fluid in there, except at night, interestingly, when your neurons actually relax a little bit and then fluid from your cerebral spinal fluid can wash through. But usually cerebral spinal fluid is found on the outside of the brain. Of course, there are ventricles inside, but then it flows around the brain and the spinal cord, around the central nervous system. And the brain and the spinal cord are themselves sort of separated from the rest of the body by a series of membranes called the meninges. And there's also so-called blood-brain barrier, which prevents the blood from really easily delivering large proteins and whatnot to the brain matter itself. So the brain, the central nervous system is relatively isolated from the rest of the body, but we can say that the fluid is more on the outside. The light activities, which again has an electrical component, is again more in the case of nerve cells when they conduct their action potentials, these little ionic currents are not inside the neuron, they're happening on the surface of the neuron. So they're on the outside as well. And then the circulatory system, if you look at the brain, kind of wraps around the brain and then plunges inward. So it comes from the outside in. So the way the fields regulate the, the fluidic, the gas light, and the warmth working through the circulatory system, how these three fields relate to the head is more from the outside in. In fact, they sort of stand outside 
And if you do develop inspirative and in these different states of consciousness that I've alluded to, some people can actually see that more as a sort of halo, a light, and that's the gas body in particular around the head. And this is what people often refer to as the halo. And even in Renaissance paintings, you see a lot of these uh, figures with the light around the head. We take it sort of symbolically today, but this was an actual experience, we could say, based on the orientation of the fields around the head. Versus in the metabolic system, the fields work from the inside out. They combine with matter. So the head, they're working more outwardly like hands sculpting clay. They work from the outside in. On the inside, on the, in the metabolic limb system, they work from the inside out. Uh, we can say that matter, you know, the, the heat, the warmth stored in chemical bonds and covalent bonds and fatty acids and all this, this is really the warmth process structured into matter than working out from the matter. Same thing with the gas light, the electrical charges and whatnot uh, in molecules. So that's, a, that's working from the inside out. And then the fluid itself also works the structured water around these proteins and whatnot, uh, works from the inside out. So <clears throat> there in the metabolic system, the different uh, fields actually align with matter very closely and they work from matter uh, inside out. And that's really what we study in biochemistry and whatnot, how all those warmth and uh, energy transformations are occurring between matter versus the neurosensory system is more like informational and it's forming and structuring these things. In the rhythmic system, the heart and the lungs, there we can say that with every contraction of the heart, we can say the fields become more head-like. They sort of expand out, stand outside. And then with every expansion of the heart, they move inward like in the metabolic system. So there's a constant oscillation of these fields, and the same thing happens in respiration, between the, the warmth and the gas light, the ego eye and the astral body, and then the physical etheric. There's sort of an oscillation between the connecting, disconnecting, connecting, disconnecting. So with every systole, we can say we connect a little bit more with our, our soul and our spirit, connects more with the body. With every diastole in the heart, relaxation, we expand out a little bit more. So back and forth this way. Um, and um, so there's a there's oscillation. So that's how the four really connects with three. These are, these three principles are universal principles. So, um, you know, this is again, a concept that I have taken here from Rudolf Steiner, but we find them in many traditional medicines, Chinese medicine. I alluded to in a couple lectures ago, this idea of the Jing, Qi, and Chen, the three primary essences. In Ayurveda, we have the idea of the three doshas, Katha, Vata, Pitta. And then in Tibetan medicine, there's also phlegm, wind, bile. Tibetan medicine had a strong, it's a combination sort of of Ayurvedic and Chinese medicine. And in Western alchemy, the alchemist Paracelsus, who lived in the uh, late 14, early 1500s, talked about the Tria Precimpia or Tria, Tria Prima the three principles and refer to these as salting, which is the formative processes like we see in the head. That's crystallization coming into materiality. Um, opposite of that was what he referred to as sulfur or phosphor, which is essentially the process of combustion. So that's uh, kind of like what happens in metabolism um, where we combust substances, release energy and heat, and use that, trap that into other molecules and back and forth this way. And the ash that's produced in the metabolism is like carbon dioxide. And then mercury is the principle of balance, the rhythm. And that's usually the balance between too much dryness and salting and too much moisture and sulfur. So there's a balancing activity there. And so we can actually put these on that terrain map that I presented in the last lecture, say that the salting is more on the cool side, like it happens in the head. We want to keep the head and the neurosensory system cool, generally for proper thinking and still. And then, and we can almost imagine thoughts as like little crystals coming down, almost like snow crystallizing down. And that's when we have a thought that kind of crystallizes into us. Um, similarly, in, this, in the metabolic system, we want to keep this warm uh, below the abdomen. And here we have the, all the, this is the heat production center. And then we have the mercury forces balancing dryness and dampness. So in a sense, this, um, these three principles, salt, mercury, and sulfur, um, are universal in this way, and we can relate them back to terrain, as I had be uh, mentioned before. Um, Paracelsus had this idea of making remedies based on the separation of these three principles from plants. So the salting would be collecting the mineral salts and the mineral ashes, 
um, and then the sulfur would be collecting the volatile oils and the mercury would be collecting the tincture, usually the, the fluid extract, usually an alcohol or something. And then you combine all three together. And the idea was that you amplify these three. And there are still uh, companies and people making spagyric remedies, uh, which you generally have to take a much smaller dosage of to have these, these effects stimulated in the body. So very ancient and universal concept. Now that brings us to the final slide here, and that is to, again, start to look more deeply. So we have these three zones of activity, the neurosensory, the rhythmic, and the metabolic limb. And I went into the discussion originally to say, well, how can we look at these so-called 11 organ systems we find from an anatomical view? How do we see them more as functional relationships? And might that simplify the list a little bit? And the answer is yes. Um, and this is going to require a lot of stretching our thinking a little bit. But for one, we can say that the neurosensory system is essentially an image, but inverted, of the metabolic limb system. Let me say that again. So what we have in the neurosensory system is an inverted image of what's going on below the, below the diaphragm and your abdominal organs. Um, so essentially, think of taking your abdominal organs, translating upward in an inversion-like way and you have the head. So a good example of that is if you take the skull off and look at the brains, you have all the gyri and sulky, the convolutions. Uh, the brain though is solid, except for the ventricles inside, but mostly it's solid. Take Open up the abdomen, you have the same gyri and sulky now in the intestines, um, but they're hollow. So in a way, the stomach, small intestine and large intestine are inverse images of the three parts of the brain that we know from embryology, the so-called hindbrain, midbrain, and forebrain. So essentially, these are the same structures metamorphosed in two different ways. And that explains a lot of these functional connections we're now seeing in the so-called gut-brain relationship, that the gut essentially is mapped in the brain, the brain is mapped into the gut. We find in the gut uh, its own nervous system with the same neurotransmitters as we see in the brain um, and vice versa, that a lot of these uh, uh, hormones and whatnot secreted by the gut actually work into the brain and have effects there. So interestingly, um, uh, we can think of the neurosensory system, the nervous system itself as a reflection of the metabolic organs. In a similar way, we can begin to think of the um, skin and the musculoskeletal system as really being secondary organs that are reflections of the metabolic organs, these processes that we see in metabolism as well as in the brain. Um, so if we begin to think more process-oriented wise, it narrows down our organ list here a little bit here. Uh, and then things like the immune system and the endocrine system also um, really are aspects of this as well. So what comes out is the primary organ processes, which for the purposes of this lecture series, I'm gonna to relate to seven. And these seven organ processes relate to what many refer to as the seven life processes. Sensation, movement, nourishment, breathing, growth, reproduction, you know, and so forth. So these seven life processes are reflected through the organs. They're reflected through the brain structures and the different neurotransmitters in the brain. They're all different images of the same seven processes. And why this is important is we can think in medicine now with any different illness condition, we can ask, what is the primary process that's disturbed? And that might manifest through several different organs, but we can think of remedies to support the different processes. And that's how people thought in traditional medicines. They were thinking more in terms of remedies supporting processes, not organs um, or structures and these different things. So I'm going to, for the purposes here, use the uh, kind of organ names that are used in Chinese medicine. Again, these refer not so much to anatomical organs, but to activities or processes that definitely do work through the anatomical organ, but they're much more than just the anatomical organ. So for example, um, uh, and before I actually make the list here, just say that each organ process really can be thought of as having a, being a pair. So in the metabolic organs, we have a pair, we have an organ that usually secretes into the blood, and then we have an organ that, that excretes into a lumen like the intestines. Uh, 
So for example, the spleen is one of the primary organs I'm going to talk about here, which interestingly in Chinese medicine and other traditional medicines is related to the digestion, not just the immune system like we relate to in the West. And I'll, I'm going to go into individual lectures on all these organs and kind of uh, explain that further. But we can think of the spleen as being paired with the stomach as well as the pancreas. So that the stomach forms more the excretory part and then the spleen is more the blood related part. Similarly, the pair of liver and gallbladder. Uh, now there's another organ pair here, which is gonna sound a little strange, but that translates uh, as pericardium or heart protector in triple warmer. Now I'm gonna have to talk about which structures and organs these activities work through. For example, thyroid hormone, the sympathetic nervous system are strongly related to this. Um, the, uh, but I'll go into that in more detail later. We have the heart and cardiovascular system. And then interestingly, the image of the heart in the metabolic zone is the small intestine. Now that's not maybe gonna make sense at first, but that's uh, something I'll explain as we go on here. Um, the kidneys and the bladder. So kidneys more related to the blood, bladder more the excretory part of the kidneys. And then the lung and the image of the lung in the metabolic zone is the large intestine. In the brain, we can say the heart itself relates in the small intestine to the midbrain structures, the hypothalamus, thalamus, uh, epithalamus, uh, pineal gland, and then the long, large intestine, the image there is, the, uh, is largely the forebrain and the largest part of the cerebrum. Uh, and then we have this organ in Chinese medicine known as the conception vessel and the governing vessel, which uh, I, I will talk about more, but that relates to our reproductive organs as well as the activities um, related to reproduction um, and growth and, and general maintenance of form. Um, so we can list these organs out, these seven organs, processes, activities, in the little diagram I have here where we can think of the, uh, I just put the and the increase in organs in the, in the picture here, but we can think of them as all being related in this type of way. And again, I'm gonna go much more into this as we uh, go through the series here. But this is the beginnings uh, of an internal map of not just organs, but as processes, uh, as systems of activity. And in a Saludojega model, the idea is to really to balance terrain, it's to balance the different life processes, not so much the physical organs this way. Um, we can go into each organ and find that each organ has all of these seven processes in it as well. And so, again, this is that holographic sort of principle that goes all the way down into each system. Okay, so that's a little bit of um, where I want to go next. Um, so moving from the extracellular terrain into organ terrain and using the sort of threefoldness principle, starting from the whole, looking down to the parts as a way of organizing these different types of thoughts. So that's all for this video. Thank you for listening. And um, as always, uh, like, feel free to share and subscribe to the channel uh, if you like the content. And uh, I look forward to seeing you in the next lecture.